Hey, I'm Dr. Luke Chesel, and I'm here with my, uh, my mentor and one of my absolute best friends in the world, Dr. Bonnie. And so I am the co-founder of Value Added 616 Inc. And he is the founder of Bontech School of Business. So today, we'd like to thank you for expressing interest in learning about the history. And we're leaving history generic because this isn't just the history of Lean, just the history of Six Sigma, just the history of Theory of Constraints. All of this stuff you'll find is this beautiful blend over time where there's agile, there's human-centered design, design thinking, you name it, they all come into play together. So what we're gonna be talking about today is what made each of these concepts, frameworks, methodologies, toolkits popular. But we're gonna go a little bit more modern history now. And I'm gonna start us, and so the idea and the framework for walking through this particular module is just that we're gonna go through the 1900s, 1910, 20, 30, 40, and we're gonna walk our way to modern times. So that you have an understanding of some of the major companies, some of the players are still in the field to this day. So let's jump right into about the 1900s. So late 1800s, early 1900s, you have this guy, Frederick Taylor, scientific management. So he really starts to take a look at it, you know, what's going on in these different factories um, where he's working, and he's working specifically with uh, pig iron is one of the examples that he uses. In a nutshell, what are they talking about is how fast these workers can pick up this pig iron, load it onto these rail cars, and how many tons can they do per day, right? So he does this scientific management. So you wanna run away a little bit with that one. This, this methodology of understanding exactly how much energy and how much time and converting that to optimizing the human path, which is different from optimizing the, the flow of the material, which is different from optimizing, mean, so th there's all these different flows, um, spaghetti diagrams, circle diagrams, there's so many ways of showing the flow. And yeah, Frederick Taylor, gosh, what was that, 120 years ago or something? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, this, is not, this is not new stuff. And yet the, the impact was huge. I mean, it literally revolutionized industry to stop just having the artisans you know it's good to have an artisan but not everybody can be an artisan it takes a long time so a, a good process with average people will crush great people with an average process every time and Frederick Taylor proved that yeah and you took into we, we see a lot of the ergonomic studies taking place at that point too so like you said the bending twisting turning all that has value and he also had he had talked about think about Jim Collins for instance says get the right people on the right seats on the bus well what he's doing for getting the right people on the right seats is you'd have people that are moving pig iron and let's say they're doing 12 and a half tons like he refers to in the books but it's wearing these guys out they're just not built for it they're not able they're not as capable so what he did is he would have them shuffling or shoveling something else switch them to another job not fire them not get rid of them but put them in the right seat on the bus so we can move forward now of course he was referring to other things Jim Collins was but yeah, I think that that's some of those ideas are coming from all the way back in the time of scientific management when we're starting to take a look at this. So it's just really cool to see the tie for the literature we have today. You know, a lot of the stuff that we, we preach and teach ties back to, you know, 100 plus years ago now. So it's really cool to see that. So we see scientific management coming into play, and there's a lot in the time motion studies. But that's kind of a brief introduction to Frederick Taylor. And I encourage you to go take a look at one of his books called Scientific Management. And he talks about an example. And he's not the only one doing it at the time, though, by the way. So he actually references other people that were doing it before he was and also at the same time. So he wasn't in a bricklaying factory, but one of his buddies was yes. also doing it over in a bricklaying factory. So it was already happening. But so being able to we were taking a look at ergonomics. And oh, by the way, this is where we also start to see some of the introduction of well, if you're putting more pig iron or you're laying more bricks or whatever, you're paid according to that. Which, which goes into the level loading, the, le the, the balancing of the workload. So where, where you are determines the prism through which you're looking at continuous improvement. Um, whether you're in a place where quality is a problem, so you're focused on improving quality. If you're in a place where variation is a problem, you're focused on consistency and reducing variation. If you're in a place where specialization or, or expertise is a constraint, then you're focused on training or ways to, to cross train. Uh, if, you're, if you're a place where, where huge distances need to be traversed, you're focused on, on leaning out or bringing together resources in a consistent way um, to, to minimize the transportation waste. So where you are affects how your, your worldview and how you're going to improve. And the luxury that we have now we get to look back on these documented best practices 
that all these different folks have in all these different industries and steal shamelessly and as, as uh, Jim Womack noted, you know, it's about certain principles that are universally true. He, he stepped back and he looked at a lot of the things that Toyota was doing in the auto industry and said, wow, this is not just about what they're doing, but it's about the core principles that drive them. Um, and and can, I, can I follow that chain backwards? So, you know, when Womack was, was studying the Toyota production system and the Toyota folks, thinking Toyota had invented this stuff, what did Toyota tell them? They came over to Ford. Yeah, they, they, Toyota got it from Ford. Yeah. So, yeah, in fact, one of, my, one of my favorite stories, anybody who's familiar with the five S's in, that, we, that we use in, in the Lean Six Sigma world, process improvement has, oh, there's a process for getting organized. We call it five S. In English, people use different S's, you know, uh, sort and separate and standardize and shine and, and, sustain. Shine and yeah. sustain. And, you know, there's these, these different S's. And you're like, well, how come we can't settle in on just five specific S's? Well, the answer is because those S's came from an English translation that actually was, I think, it came over to the, to the, in, in, into English in the 90s based on a Japanese book from the 70s. Um, and forgive me, I'm, I'm, I, I'm rough timelining here, um, where the Japanese used five S's in Japanese. Seri, Seton, Seto, Seso, Saiketsu, Shitsuke. They had five Japanese S's. But the question is, where did the Japanese get those S's? And if you ask them where they got their five S's, Henry Ford. <laughs> Henry Ford had the can-do process. Clean, arrange, neatness, discipline, ongoing improvement. The can-do process from the 1920s turned into the five Japanese S's of the 50s that were written down in the 70s, translated into the 90s, and then they became the English five S's that we use today. It's like, really? Really? It's been around that long. It's been around 100 years. Well, that's a, I mean, that's a great segue, too, right there, because you were talking about Henry Ford who we know is he popularized the uh, uh, assembly line, right? Of course, there was other areas of the world where it was being used too, but he popularized it. Like we said, we're gonna be dealing with the people who popularized these things, not necessarily invented, but they're the ones who used it and probably used it the best. So Henry Ford is you know, credited with doing a lot of things. He built off from that scientific method that we, or the scientific management that we saw from Frederick Taylor. And he takes other, uh, you know, aspects into consideration where Frederick Taylor was starting to look into um, the human aspect, making sure we're, we're paying for the work. If we're asking them to do more in less time, we're paying them accordingly. And Ford, another thing that he, we don't often see, and he would pay people so they not only could cover their daily, their, their uh, you know, daily life, but also paid them enough so that they would have some leisure money in his own word. He, write that, he writes that in his books. Um, Five dollars a day, big box. Yeah, Henry Ford, my life and works. He t he talks about that where he paid people appropriately. So not only is he, not only do we need to give him credit for the assembly line and you know mass production, which by the way it's going to come into play when we talk about the Japanese in a little bit here, but he was popular for that. And then also you know Henry Ford, you know he made sure that he brought into point of use was another thing too. He would say, all right, ergonomically and for, for efficiency, why don't we bring the bolts up to the line where the bolts are being put on? Why don't we bring you know, the, the, the car forward down the line and have everything waiting on it? Why isn't there some sort of system that says when I'm out of bolts, which will be popularized and be given credit to the Japanese for Kanban, which we'll talk about in a bit, but the idea, the idea behind Kanban was essentially Ford was already doing it when they were low on the bolts, if you're putting the bolts on the tires, right, to keep them attached to the car and they get low, there's some sort of signal that says, hey, psst, I'm out of bolts and I, I need more bolts, bring me some more to the line. And somebody runs them over and gets you more bolts. That being said, I mean, there's a lot more to Ford than we often give him credit for. So F Henry Ford, uh Truly, truly a, a, a genius. Um, so many of these folks that we're talking about are products of their times, right? I mean, no, nobody's perfect. There's, there's a lot of, um, you know, I, I don't want to be judged on who I was even 10 years ago, you know, let, let alone who I, you know. So, but, but based on their, their industry genius, their understanding of, of waste, for example, um, in many cases, it's an understanding of culture. So it's not just a, an attitude of, of waste, it's an attitude of always learn, 
All right, continuously learning, and, and if you're not sure, try it, and if you fail, then you learned. And if you try it and you succeed, then you learned and you got better. So always a bonus. Uh, if you, it, literally, if you try something and you fail, the cost of trying is tuition, right? You paid the tuition and you learned. And, and that idea of, of always paying tuition and sometimes getting benefits immediately, but always getting benefits eventually, um, it was something, <laughs> sorry, I'll, I'll use a story about Henry Ford. The, he was so obsessed with efficiency and using everything that the idea of hauling empty pallets away bothered him. So he made sure that he put specs on the, on the quality of the wood on the pallets that things were being shipped on so, so that after they had used the product off of the pallets, they would disassemble the pallets and use the wood as parts of the car. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to bring up a little contrast between the two, and this is what I had noticed. When you're looking at Frederick Taylor, Frederick Taylor in his, in his books, he refer, you know, he, he will, um, and I'll give this kind of a, a negative view a little bit, but he talks about you really need to be college educated to truly understand how to do scientific management and things like that. He really points that it's, it's not kind of an every man's game. The people who run the experiments should be the well-educated stuff where Henry Ford in his book talks about, I give free liberty and I listen to my frontline employees and we should be hearing from them on yeah. what works best. Whereas Frederick Taylor would be like, hey, we're our group of scientists or people doing the time management studies and stuff, they're, they're kind of in charge and they're gonna get feedback from you Whereas Ford was more like, no, if you have a good idea, bring it forward, which again, the Japanese took, you know, used at Toyota and is still to this day. They took that idea and who knows best how to fix the problem? For the people doing the job. I see them as being contrasting in that piece. Whereas Frederick Taylor seemed a little more hardlined about, yeah, you need to be kind of the educated person and you know you got to listen to them and do as i say and and exactly the way i say it whereas ford was a little bit more people friendly in, in he, a way he he was egalitarian in terms of where he was willing to to get ideas you know to, to quote ratatouille <laughs> um a, a great chef can come from anywhere right and henry ford didn't care whose great idea it was he just cared if it was a good idea right uh, and all of us are smarter than any of us so the idea of, and, and, and again, the Toyota production system, we're, we're familiar with the Japanese word, the gemba, the place where the work is done, the place where it happens. And they'll always say, go to the gemba. Um, the answer is at the gemba. Well, who's at the gemba? Yeah. It's not the elite. <laughs> it's no. not the folks no. in the ivory shower. It's not the C-suite, right? That's the, the workers who are doing it every day. If you want to figure out how to do what they do best, watch them. And if you, if you want to make your process better, ask them what's eating their lunch, what's making life hard for them, because that's where the learning opportunities are. And if you want to try out a new idea, ask them before you do it. When you're looking at like Wikipedia and looking these up, when I say 1920s, of course, for, you know, Ford transcends you know, several generations, so does Frederick Taylor, all of them. I'm just giving you a rough kind of decade period to work from so that we have a, a reference. So let's, let's go to the 20s now. So Dr. Walter Schuhart. So Dr. Schuhart now introduces statistical process control. I'm gonna leave this in his realm. Take her away. So Dr. Schuhart invented control charts. And there's basically seven kinds of control charts based on the kind of data that you have and how you collect your data. Now let me, I'm gonna go there. See this big fat book? Maynard's Industrial Engineering Handbook. Fifth edition, in 2022, the sixth edition is coming out. I wrote the chapter on statistics. I know a thing or two about statistics. Big fan, right? It's, it, everybody's trying to quantify what they know. No, yeah. statistics are awesome because they quantify what you don't know, yeah. all right? I don't know this, but I can make an educated guess that it's somewhere in this range, and then you can run hypothesis tests to validate and to reduce the variation in your knowledge or to, 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 to figure out what you, what you thought you knew but you really didn't, or better yet, what you thought you knew and now you can prove that you really do know it. Statistics are awesome, but if I only had one tool in my entire statistical arsenal, if I only had one, I want Dr. Schuhart's control charts. They are visual, they, they, they help you to see the data over time, they help you to see patterns and trends, they help you to see the variation as well as the average, mm -hmm. they help you to, to quantify um, and communicate literally anybody who has been at the Gemba, who has been at the place where the work is done, can look at that control chart and 
they understand it better than anybody, right? They can see, oh, that's how much time it took between this one and the next one, or that's how much variation occurred, you know, whatever the metric is that you're plotting. And they can see the data, and they can see how it's going up and down, and they can see, oh, it goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And the average person looks at it, and they have no idea. But the person who works at the Gemba, they look at that like, oh, yeah, you're day shift, night shift, day shift, night shift, night shift. Of course it's going to go up and down like that. And you're like, well, it would not have occurred to the average person why there would be basically a bimodal distribution. Yeah. But the person who works there, they know. They know. And that allows them to visualize and quantify and validate that there's a difference between the two shifts, which stimulates the conversation, well, what, what, what should we do differently? Why is it that day shift consistently performs worse than night shift? That's easy. All you frickin' supervisors and managers are always out there telling us what to do and getting in our way. Night shift, we can just get her done. Ah, so actually, it's our, it's our fault. Yeah, who knew? So, but the point of the control chart is when you get somebody who's been there and you help them to quantify the right things and then you help them to visualize those right things and you help them to visualize it with descriptive statistics that describe the samples so we can describe it with the average and you can describe it with the range or the variation, standard deviation, whatever. And then you can do inferential statistics to infer not just what has happened, but you can infer beyond the population into the future and do inferential statistics and say, therefore, I expect this. And therefore, I want, if I want anything to get better than that, I need to go make a change. And how do I make that change? I go right back to those smart people who work the day job every day, and I say, you said there was a difference between day shift and night shift? What is that? How can we reduce that variation? How can we make that more consistent? And they become involved in the process. And it all feeds back, and then you, 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 you run the experiment, right? We're, we're, it literally treats every employee as a scientist. This goes back to the, to the I really was coming somewhere, <laughs> back to where That's we started. Right. Right? It comes back to everybody can be a scientist. Everybody can be a process engineer, a process scientist. Anybody can be a problem solver. Not everybody should be. Not everybody's good at it, but anybody can be. And so if you empower everybody with that kind of thinking, with a culture of transformation, with a culture of challenging and asking questions, that's awesome. And it's not about questioning you know, to fix the blame. It's about questioning to fix the problem. And that little so subtle tweak was something that Henry Ford was great at. Um, and not everybody is great at that because, quite honestly, not everybody is genius enough like Schuhart to take this complex math in a pre-computer era and to simplify it in a way so that I, I literally in the, in the early 90s, I worked in a manufacturing plant where we didn't have computers. It was, a, it was an old school, I won't, I won't name the company, but it was an old school manufacturing plant in the, in the Midwest. And the, there were people in there who had fifth grade educations. And you know, they, had, they had quit school and they just went to work there. And they showed me how to do statistical process control. I walked in there with a master's degree. And they were showing me how to do it. And the guy on the production floor was showing me how he was collecting the data and how he was plotting it and how you could see patterns and trends and if it was beyond a certain range then you needed to go make a change but if it stayed within a certain range you didn't have to i'm like wow that's genius but it takes genius to take complex ideas and make them simple enough that the average person can do it and with shuhart so this will this will still build on that because moving to the essentially the 30s about the time frame when when he's at western electric right so he brings up the statistical process control makes the complex simple make, helps us to understand all that what that drives next is the need then to say, well, my gosh, now that we're past this whole gut feel, yeah. it's time to put these quality departments into place. Like we need to do something that's going to help us to address these quality issues. Why are we having the variation now that we've kind of isolated it? We find out when there's special cause, something's weird, right? So something's out of whack. Who, who knew there was a way to quantify weird? Yeah. So you <laughs> quantify this weird or something happens or why is there a difference between shift A and B? Well, that's where these quality departments come into play. And then we move into the 40s and 50s. Now this is where the, it starts to really shift. So when World War II happens, this really changes the dynamic of everything going on. And in Korea, so the Korean War also. So both of these 
turn us into what? Industrial and manufacturing powerhouses, right? Where we need to be. So things change. And think about what Ford is doing at this point is he's mass producing war machines at this point for the industrial, for all this, the industrial complex. So that being said, we see people like uh, D Dr. W. Edwards Deming and Joseph Duran. So I'm going to talk about those two before we head overseas for a bit, even though they did go overseas. <laughs> yeah, they did. Yes, they did. So where do we see the importance of Deming and Duran come into play? The, the idea of, uh, that uh, how do I say it, that, that quality pays for itself. You know, the idea that uh, you can do a cost-benefit analysis that justifies investing in quality, that, that can justify having a, a full, not, not just a quality department, but having a quality-minded organization. You get Deming's 14 points. They're not quality points. They're leadership points. I mean, if, if you want to run a business, if you want to be a successful, you know, successful in industry, you've got to know those 14 points. And you got to do them. Um, and for folks like uh, like you and me, we've been through leadership training with the military. You know, Marine Corps major, thank you for your service. Um, we we got trained in these fourteen points without ever even realizing that they were that they were dumbing or you know that, that these had their quality history because it's just good leadership, right? Train people if you <laughs> do it right the first time. Right, because if you don't, you got to do it again, and that costs you more time. It costs you more money. It costs you additional resources, and in a military environment, it might have cost you your life. Uh, so, so don't don't hedge, right? Don't don't fake it till you make it. Do it right, uh, and learn because so, anything that you didn't do right, you, you can you can do better the next time. And at this point, though, on American soil, we're doing pretty well with mass production, and we're doing okay over here, right? So true. Yeah. Deming and Duran aren't, uh, let's just say they, they aren't believed to be as necessary on American soil at this point. A prophet in his own country, so, yes. So, that being said, where did they end up going? Sorry. Deming studies under, under Schuhart. In fact, the, the Deming cycle, the Plan Do Check Act, Plan Do Study Act, we won't even get into the debate of which came first and who did what. And anyway, Chicken or the egg? Yeah, but the point was Deming's Plan Do Check Act was Schuhart. It was the Schuhart cycle. And Deming popularized the Schuhart cycle, especially in Japan, because in the United States we're like, yeah, we got this, right? We, we just we just won the war. We just the, right. it wasn't just a war; it was a world war. We won. You're welcome. Now our industry is going to stop making jeeps and start making you know luxury. Cars. We were somewhat arrogant at the point. And, and I won't even say whether it was a well-deserved arrogance. But uh, but but it was absolute. When, when you're when you're ahead. That's the time to expand the lead, not to yeah. let rest on your laurels. And so Taiichi Ono in his book, because I'm going to switch to the, you know, going to going overseas now to, to uh, Toyota and Taiichi Ono. So Taiichi Toyota and Taiichi Ono. So in Taiichi Ono's book, he references uh, Toyota actually saying to them, listen, and this is about 1945, war is just ending. And he says, uh, I'm trying to think, I'm somewhat paraphrasing, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm pretty close to the exact quote. He's like, we have three years, and I want us to be better than the Americans. Yeah, and how, he tells how, Ono to do that. Taiichi Ono. How, how do you how do you do that? I mean, when you anybody ever been in the situation? Post World War II. Yeah, your boss is like, you know, just go do the impossible by yesterday. And Ono actually said impossible too. He goes, it felt impossible when he told us to do that. So United States, big country, virtually untouched by the war. Mm -hmm. Japan, little country, devastated by the war. Um, I won't even just say decimated, one in ten, literal definition of decimation. No, they were, they, they had lost their best and their brightest of multiple generations. I mean, they had been crushed. Infrastructure crushed, everything, just, you name just, it. And, 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 and then all, anyway, I, yeah. I, I, you, you get the idea. It's impossible. And, you know, even if they could make amazing vehicles or or any product they have no market everybody's broke how do you sell cars in a place that has no roads that has no that has nobody with money to buy a car they don't even have money to buy food yeah. how do you do this when the united states literally was made for cars well and then one of the things he talks about is he says hey listen we want to be like them or better than the americans right so 
what is Ford doing at this point? Is there mass production? That's what Ford's been doing. And I'm just keep referencing Ford, but again, there's GM and other companies, but so there's mass production and that's right for our culture. Dr. B had mentioned culture earlier. For our culture, mass production was fine. It was okay, that's what was accepted and that's what we were doing. But you can't do that in a devastated country. The economy is just blasted, the infrastructure is gone. They're in a different mindset. They had just essentially lost the war. So Taiichi Ono references that and he talks about, we wanted to be essentially like Ford. So think of the word benchmarking, like Ford, but not Ford, Yes. right? We can't be Ford because we aren't built to be, our, our culture is not ready to be Ford. Essentially, even if we could mass produce, it wouldn't work. We'd have inventory sitting around, they'd rot. So Ford, that Ford said, would not have succeeded if Ford were located. No, in he Japan. wouldn't. No, no, yeah. Ford would not have made it in Japan. He, he wouldn't have. It was yeah. the culture of the time. Everything was kind of the, the right recipe, right timing. So, so we'll kind of build from, from there is just saying, hey, they have to take a different approach. So they have to do their own thing, their own Toyota production system, which has two key facets. So they've got their automation and they've got just in time, which is they use Kanban as their, as their unlocking and, mechanism. And for, for those who don't speak geek, automation is, is literally the, it, it, it literally means the, the marriage of automation and the human component. It's the, it's the optimized integration of people and technology for, mm -hmm. for those who don't speak yep. autonomous. So they have those two major components and then that just in time, which essentially, you know, is, is what it says it is. It's just in time. It means we don't just pump out 10,000 cars and I'm sitting on a lot, getting rained on in the monsoons and rusting out and they become obsolete. They're saying, we basically are gonna move one, make one, move one, make one. Like, so, the, so as the orders come in, we're making them and we're kind of marrying that up. We have just, of course, safety stock and buffers and things like that, but we, don't just sit around and fill car lots full of cars. We do things just in time, which means smaller batches of certain types of cars they're making, right? Because that's what the demand is for these smaller pockets and styles of cars. So they did many styles of cars, but smaller batches, whereas Ford was just mass producing and saying, hey, listen, we're gonna make this type of model or these couple of models, and we're just gonna put you know, hundreds of thousands of them out, in it, out into the world and people will buy them, right? Totally different markets at this point. Taiichi Ono in his book talks about, he says, the worst waste of them all, the yes. mother of all the wastes is yes. overproduction. Just because we can make it doesn't mean we should make it. So, uh, and, and Ford didn't get that. They're like, well, if, if I have a choice between having my people not do anything, and, and in fairness, it was a, it was a unionized environment, sure. so those folks mm -hmm. were going to get paid. Right. So if you're chief financial officer, you're the money wonk, and you're just thinking about cash flow, I'm gonna be paying the building. I gotta pay for the building anyway. Employees, I gotta pay for the employees anyway. Why would I not build the truck and just store it so I can sell it later? There's a whole lot of good reasons, but fundamentally, culturally, they let money people drive the, drive the business, literally and figuratively, rather than letting process people drive the business. Instead of trying to do the right thing at the right time in the right way, they just, nope, just keep going, just keep going. But the, the point is, Toyota learned quickly because they had to, because they had to survive. That's right, yeah. And in the United States, we were fat and lazy. Mm -hmm. And we didn't even think about learning until the 80s when the Japanese are starting to not just catch us, but starting to kick our butts. And then we're like, wait, wait, wait a minute, how did, how did that happen? Easy. <laughs> we sucked and they didn't yeah. because they kept on learning and we stopped. All right, so here we are now at the 1960s. So in the 1960s, you have a guy, Shigeo Shingo. So <laughs> we're back into Japan at this point, and Shigeo Shingo takes a concept called Kaizen. And Kaizen is these small incremental improvements. So instead of taking on these monster projects of, hey, let's overhaul the entire factory, let's you know focus on how do we make it so we can put the wheels on better. How can we take on something that's a small, more manageable chunk? you know, these everyday small incremental improvements. It's a, it's a concept of saying, let's not, not, let's not save a million dollars every time we do this. What about saving $1 at a time, one minute at a time, right? So how can we make it, we do this one screw faster at a time and it all adds up. So the Kaizen concept, where you see these smaller projects, um, that really gets popularized and formalized. Though they've been doing it for a while, it's, it's really popularized in the 60s, so. Yeah, Shingo is another one of those guys, just, just an amazing, 
my definition of genius is not somebody who comes up with a really complicated, sophisticated idea. My definition of genius is the person who can take that and simplify it to the point where even a caveman can do it. And that's, that, that's, that's Shingo. What Shingo was able to do was he was able to take, take complex ideas. In fact, I'll, I'll, may, I, may I quote you? Because I, I, so I had the, the privilege of sitting in when, when Dr. Chesla became Dr. Chesla when you were doing your defense um, at AMU. And it was, it was fun watching your defense because you were the first person, probably the first person I even remember ever quoting Shingo in one of my favorite quotations of Shingo, which is easier, then better, then faster, then cheaper, always in that order. I mean, literally, if you want to do process improvement, where do you start? Just make it easier. Yeah. Oh, it's as easy as you can do it? Good. Then make it easier and better. Oh, it's already first time quality every time. Oh, good. Then make it easier and better and faster. And, and if you do those things in that order, and forgive me for running down the side path, but you know, if you make it easier for the person to do what they need to do, what happens? They're more likely to do it right. And if there's a problem, they're more likely to see it and say, hey, I got a problem. All right? And if you set up the structure so that people aren't hiding their problems, they're waving their hands and say, hey, I need help, and they get help, then you're making things, you know, they can see clearly, and they're not stressed out, and they have the support of the organization to do the right things in the right way, and they get help when they have problems. Easier makes things better. And easier and better means you're doing it right the first time, so you don't have to do it again, which means it's cheaper. I'm sorry, oh, which means it's faster. And because it's faster, it's going to be cheaper because you're making higher, higher volumes per unit time. So each of those leads to the other. Shingo is just brilliant to just say that. Easier, then better, then faster, then cheaper. Always in that order. We also recognize, too, in Japan, one of the things in the, a lot of the literature, when you're looking back at this, is that the Japanese did a really good job, I thought, well, especially Toyota, right? They, they understood that the errors that they made or the inefficiencies that they had, they didn't pass that on to the customer. Yes. That was a big thing about Japan, too, where in America, a lot of times you can just charge more in the car and say, hey, it's just taking more to build it. And that's because you're accounting for the errors and all those other things that are happening. And by the way, Ford didn't, was not all about that, just so you know, but by this time, Ford's uh, not there. Yeah. So what happens is you have these car companies over here doing that, and we're starting to jack up the prices a little bit. There's a lot of quality issues that were happening, and the Japanese recognized that. And they also, since they were working on these Kaizens, these small incremental improvements, they were not passing on the losses to their customers, make them pay for it. They were starting to really kick our rear ends. Now, so that gets us into the 70s. So when we're getting more late 70s and kind of pushing into the 80s, but we're going to call it the 70s decade here. So when we're sitting in the 70s, then um, we start to sit back a little bit and say, OK, well, first of all, culturally or something that's going on globally is there is this uh, oil shortage. Right. What happens is we're getting our rear ends handed to us, to be to, to put it lightly. And we're suffering in quality. We're making our people pay a lot more for the cars. Um, and Japan just isn't doing that. So they're starting to dominate the market. And when we say, listen, it's, it's time for us to fight back, right? And we've got to start taking, we've got to start taking this a little more serious. We've got to watch our quality. We've got to drive our prices down. We have to make this more economical for folks. And, and so what happens in the late 70s uh, time frame in this, in this decade is you're seeing a lot of American car manufacturers are starting to adopt the just-in-time concepts. And so where you saw all of Japan, or Japan over the, you know, in this history discussion, they're looking back at Ford and America. Well, guess what? They did what we did and did it better. Then all of a sudden we come back and say, uh-oh, now we are studying Japan and Toyota. Yeah. So it went from them stealing from us and getting better than us to us stealing from them so we can be better than them. <laughs> and that's what you see starting to take place in the 1970s and then especially pushing into the 1980s. So I'll let you take over at Motorola. You, you can always go back. If, if, you're, if you are ever concerned about arrogance, because <laughs> if, the, if the goal is a learning organization, arrogance is your enemy. 
as soon as you start thinking you are better or you're the first, you're wrong. <laughs> you're yeah. just wrong. And, and so we, we had this arrogance and it crushed us. To their credit, when, when, when Ford realized, and again, we'll, we'll pick on Ford again, this is a, sort of a u universal thing, but specifically when Ford was like, what is Toyota doing? How are they able to, to, to do this volume, to do this quality? How can they sell these vehicles for this price when they have to ship them across thousands of miles to get to this country? We're building them right here. And their vehicles are faster, and or, or their vehicles are cheaper and, and, and better, and what, what's going on? And they said, hey, Toyota, you mind if we send some folks over to, to look around your plants? And this was a big deal for, for Ford. They're like, you know, th th this is crazy. Wait, should we have people like, you know, with sunglasses and, and hats and sort of <laughs> sneaking around surreptitiously? Like, corporate espionage. Yeah, corporate, pure corporate es espionage. Like, let's... Let's be open about this. We're going to get caught. Let's be open about this. Uh, in, in fairness, there had been some espionage anyway. But the but, but point is, they ask, and Toyota's like, yeah, sure, come on through. And Ford's walking around, and they're, they're, they're just like, this is amazing. This is, this is just a, such an efficient operation, and moving the parts up like this, and, and then, you know, when the, when the container's empty, you put it up, and that's the signal so that the guy knows to come and bring in some more parts. I mean, this is just brilliant. How, how did you come up with this? And Toyota's like, we learned it from you. But Ford had forgotten. And, yeah. But the fact that Toyota was not intellectually arrogant, that they didn't pretend that they had come up with this and they were the end all be all. No, they had the humility to say, no, we learned. We learned from you and we're happy to share back with you. Um, that's the sign of a great company. That's the sign of a great culture, a respectful teaching, learning, Together we all are going to be better. When the water rises, all the boats go up together. That's what you're looking for. And that's, that's really the sign of, of, of a great company anywhere, of a great leader anywhere. They're not trying to protect. They're trying to share. All right, so now where we get, this is where I have to, to have a little insert or take a moment because we're about to hit the 1980s. So when we get to the 1980s, this is where you're getting where lean and six sigma, lean six sigma talk, theory of constraints, all those types of things. Those are where you see it now. So we're actually gonna be able to switch gears a little bit. And now we're gonna talk about, for instance, Motorola, where we're gonna step away from the auto manufacturing industry and say, okay, we've had this long history. You guys have listened to you know us talking about history and it's just car, 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 right? Now we're going to flip this script because it's about this time frame, about the 1980s. So you're sitting about 40, you know, a little over 40 years ago. And we start to open it up to say, maybe this stuff isn't just for car manufacturing. Maybe there's other types of manufacturing. Maybe there's service industry. Maybe there's, well, even now there's restaurants, there's software development, all these places where it can be used. That starts to get popularized in the 1980s. So we're going to kick it off with where some of the phrasing that you even hear, like Six Sigma, for instance, we've said it a thousand times in this video, where did that word come from? And that's why we have to discuss Motorola. So Motorola, um, a, a wonderful example of, of high-speed manufacturing. You know, we, we, we traditionally, the old school uh, manufacturing processes, if you think about the automotive industry, they really... I don't want to say they began, but they were among the first to really take advantage of high-speed yeah. manufacturing. Mm -hmm. But high-speed manufacturing, building you know a thousand trucks a day, is not the same thing as a thousand chips a minute. <laughs> and so, from Motorola, if if you want to ensure first-time quality, because I mean, think about it: if if you screw up, and you you don't know if you you know if you're manufacturing all these chips and you grab a sample and you go check and you're like, oh crap, we, you know, the, the ratio is wrong or these, you know, any, even the smallest little thing. And you're, you're growing chips. I mean, you, <laughs> it's not like you're just stamping them out. So the, a, a crystalline structure, anyway, so they had to be rigorous in reducing variation. And the smallest little issue could cost them incredible volumes of, of lost productivity, of, of, of just pure waste. Well, um, me, so, but, but for context for the folks, so what's going on here too is Motorola 
in their industry was starting to lose some uh, some ground. So they were be, they were the industry leaders that we were starting again to get beat by folks overseas because they were creating chips and stuff at higher quality. So enter Motorola and back to your story. But the point is the context is there was once again a need because overseas we were getting our butts handed to us in chips now. Yeah, and and we, you you would think we would learn, and you know I. I I'm, I'm a big fan of the United States. <laughs> I, I've been to 30 countries. Me too. And I'm still a big fan of the United States. Despite all of our weaknesses, um, the strengths outweigh the weaknesses. But man, we gotta get over the arrogance. Yeah. <laughs> we are just so full of ourselves. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? You didn't invent this, and, and you certainly, you don't, you don't deserve to be the leader unless you're busting your butt to be the leader. And even if you are busting your butt, you better be learning every single day, right? How many books have you read in the last six months? I'm, I'm, I'm blindsiding this poor man here. Probably 10, maybe. 10. And, and how many have you listened to on MP3? Because you, you I, I know it's a lot. Listen yeah. to probably eight out of the 10 okay, on okay. Audio, audible.com, yeah. All right. So, but the point is, um, you're, you're running a business. You're building a business, you're running a business, you're planning videos, you're inviting strange people like me to, to join you. You're doing a lot of other stuff, and you will not stop learning. You will not stop interviewing people, you will not stop reading books. You, you have this craving to continue to get better. That's what it takes to be on top, right? That, that's absolutely necessary. And what is the recurring theme of our story over the last 100 years of continuous improvement history? Complacency kills. Complacency kills. And, uh, and, but to their credit, um, when, when folks find themselves backed against the wall, you know, Toyota was like, we, we've got to, we're, we're going to, go out of business unless we can yeah. compete with the Americans in three years. That's impossible. Figure it out. Yeah. And you have to have that glove thrown down. You have to have that target. And there has to be that level of accountability. And you just got to go. And then when you get to the top, you keep on going. Yeah. And Motorola, they, they got complacent. And, and it was, as was so easy to do. And then they realized that that was a bad idea. And so they they took some of these great methodologies. Because, let's be honest, not everybody has the same problem, right? If you only make five of something a week, or five of something a year, or, or go the other way, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're building an aircraft carrier, one every four years or so, you know, if, if, you, if you have a low volume manufacturing process, you're probably not thinking about quality the same way, you know, a thousand chips a minute, yeah. They're thinking about it. They had to change how they thought about things, and they had to control everything. They had to they, they had to change the worldview to an equation, right? Y, the output, is a function of the X's, the inputs. And they had to go back and deeply study all those X's and figure out which ones mattered and reduce the variation. And how do you do that? You have to use statistical process control. You have to use tight process controls. You have to have measurements that are ridiculously accurate. Uh, ideally automated within the system, uh, ideally a system that can, can provide immediate feedback, but ideally if, if, if you're doing the right things the right way every time, you don't have to measure everything and try to control everything. A consistent process is self-regulating, self-organizing, um, you know, it's got the right feedback systems, and you don't have to inspect anything. I mean, you can spot check, but you don't have to inspect if the process is robust. They were the first ones to really start to apply high-end math to their processes to, to, so they didn't have to inspect the crap out of everything. Because, tell me, Luke, is inspection value added? Nope. <laughs> no. We'll talk about that in another video. Yes, we will. But no. Inspection is non-value added, but sometimes it's necessary. But ideally, you want to make a process where you don't have to inspect, where you don't have to measure. Yeah, they got that zero defect mentality. Yep, and that zero defect mentality, what they used to call the five nines. Back in the old days, 99.999%. 99.999%. What, what, is, what, is, what is that on like a, on a standard normal curve? Where, where is that? That's <laughs> it's right around six sigma. Actually, it's 4.5 sigma, but it depends yeah, on short-term versus long-term variation. We won't get into that geeky crap. Um, but but point is, there's there's a math mathematical equation that defines good enough, 
And when you get to that point, you can stop inspecting and you can save an awful lot of money. And you can just focus on doing the value added stuff. And you can kick somebody else's butt for a change, which feels way better than getting your butt kicked. Yeah, I think they, in, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was three years, it was like $2.2 $2 billion or something like that was the, that was the, the revenue. I, so I, you can fact check me. I, I have forgotten that. Somewhere number, around like $2.2 $2. Right. $2 billion um, is what they did in like a few years. And then GE followed and Kodak and... Uh, um, well, well yeah, GE and, followed after what Allied Signal Allied did Signal, from, yeah. from, was it Larry Bossidy? Yeah. So, but Six Sigma, the reason this one's important to talk about Motorola is Six Sigma was, was coined from Motorola and it was from what Michael Harry and Bill Smith. So, so and I, I don't want to, yeah, so, you, it, and, and it's that kind of a combo team. Like Bill Smith, I, forgive me, I don't want to overstate, but Bill Smith was really the, the creator of the methodology. Okay. Um, he was the, I don't want to say the brains, it's a different, he was more of the IQ versus the EQ. Um, Michael Harry, uh, smart guy, great guy, I've, I've, I've met Michael Harry, I've, actually I met him when I was working in the Pentagon. Um, so, and he actually came to the, the, to the Lean Six Sigma program office of the, of the Office of Secretary of Defense where I worked. And it was, you know, it was cool, I'm like, oh, it's you, awesome. So is it Michael or Mikkel? Yeah, no, but it, it's, it's Michael. But, um, <laughs> but, but he was a great salesman. None of us would have heard of Six Sigma if it weren't for Michael Harry. Um, and so where one was focused on doing, you know, developing methodology there, the other was the evangelist, sharing that methodology with everybody which was the really cool thing about the 80s and 90s, when all of these different companies focused on their own things. You know, Motorola is focused on high volume manufacturing, zero defects, five nines, mm -hmm. call it what you will. Oh, let's call that Six Sigma. Oh, that's cool, I like that, that Sigma thing. Michael Harry was into the martial arts. He was the reason why they went into the belt system, green belts and black belt and master black belt. He loved that idea of continuous development of skills and tools and, and kata you know, he, he made it approachable to the average person. Oh, green belt, I've heard of that. Yeah, well this is not a green belt in karate or ninjutsu or whatever, this is a green belt in process improvement. You're gonna kick that process's butt. And it sold and it worked and, and it still does. But there are other folks that were focused on the waste. So other organizations where they, their, their primary focus was less on high volume, you know, reducing variation and more on, let's just do more efficiently do what we're doing. And so they just focused in on the waste. And there were other folks that were focused more on, on the constraints of the organization and level loading and line balancing and just different ways of solving the same problems. But form follows function. And these guys in different organizations that were responsible for solving problems were sharing good ideas like crazy and they were cross-pollinating and they were talking with each other. And there were no belt wars. There's no lean versus six sigma versus theory of constraints. It was all sharing. I'm not going to name names, but it was wonderful right up until one nameless organization thought, you know what, I bet we could make some money selling this methodology. And as soon as they stopped sharing openly and started just, just taking their best way and put up the walls and started selling the methodology, uh, all the learning, all yeah. the smartest people who were sharing those great ideas, all that great innovation that was going on, the walls went up. And you had your Six Sigma folks and your Lean folks. So uh, in the in the grand scheme, I definitely don't want to skip over this one in this 1980s time frame ish. Is Eli Goldratt? Ellie, as a physicist, looked at the universe and said, "There is always a constraint, and the the." the rate of change, the rate of innovation, the rate of productivity, the capacity, the efficiency, all of these things come back to one thing. And if you can identify the constraint in a system and you improve just that one constraint, you improve the capacity of the entire organism, the entire organization. But if you improve everything except the constraint, you improve nothing. Yeah. It makes no difference. I love that, yeah. And, and this idea of, and, and we, when we get into the lean principles of value stream management, looking at the core process that the organization delivers, they have a core process that delivers a core product that delivers a key outcome to the key customers. And that simple focusing tool that was so important to the lean guys, Jim Womack was wonderful at communicating that nice, simple Toyota vision 
you know, of value stream mapping. But then folks like Ellie Goldratt were like, well, wait a minute. And, and by the way, these are independent, right? So they're not talking to each other. But Ellie's looking at this, the core process of any organization, and he says, you know what? If that's a fire hose, and you're trying to improve the velocity of the water flowing through the fire hose, or the capacity of the water, because those are two different things, uh, how do you do that? Do you have to fix, you have to have a bigger fire hose all the way across all 50 foot of fire hose? No, you just gotta look for the kink in the hose. <laughs> Yep. It's not complicated, so find the kink and unkink it. And if you can unkink the hose in that one spot, add 20% capacity, you just added 20% capacity to the entire hose. Mind blown, right? And that, that was what Ellie brought to the table as a physicist. He's like, I'm not a business guy, I don't have an MBA, but, but physics is physics. You know, chemistry is chemistry. Constraints is constraints. So use that thinking. And the thing I love about what we do now, in hindsight, looking back through these you know, hundreds of years of history, is to take the best of all those good ideas and to look back and say, wow, we can take the value stream management approach, the visualization of the core value stream and that kind of thinking from Womack, from the Toyota production system. And we can take the theory of constraints approach to identify the constraints. I don't have to fix the entire organization. I can just fix one or two spots. By the way, if you work in those spots, you're really happy <laughs> to have it identified that you need help. And if you don't work in those spots, you're happy to help those other guys because that means everybody's looking at them instead of you. So this culturally to apply theory of constraints through a value stream prism and then to look at those constraints and find out what is the problem. And half the time the problem is poor quality, right? Oh, you don't have a zero defect mentality? Let's bring in some Six Sigma. <laughs> and let's do Lean Six Sigma or do Six Sigma at the constraint to improve the lean flow. It all comes together and we all sing yeah. Kumbaya. And that's something that we're finally doing now. That for so many years, everybody had islands of genius amidst a morass of idiocy. When we are pushing forward to the 2000s now, um, we are starting to get a little bit of a barrier. We found our way around the monetizing piece so much that we can, we've, we've built common bodies of knowledge at this point. Yeah. We have some things that are accepted, some methodologies, rules of thumb, things like that. So now we can finally get it out and it starts to be accepted. And this is kind of the last point I wanted to bring up before we, we uh, conclude is we it found its way into the American government. It did. And so, it became so accepted. We know the government's usually about you know 20 years behind industry, probably at best if we're lucky. So that being said, you know they finally adopt it in what was it about 2009, I believe. You want to elaborate on the, the presidential order or the sure? That came out? So and I'm I'm going to get the exact dates wrong, but I believe it was under uh, George W. Bush. He he put out an executive order um, that said every government agency will have a chief management officer, mandated by the president. And by the way, few, since then, m many presidents have either re-signed off on that or changed yep. happy to glad and then put out their own executive orders that said the same thing. I'm sorry, that read the same thing. Uh, so, um, so it was, I, I don't remember the exact year, but I, I do know this, OSD stood up their, their own Lean Six Sigma program in 2008. Oh, sorry, Office of Secretary of Defense set yep. up their own Lean Six Sigma program. And I think the most recent mandate that I saw was 09. So I it, don't know if they've updated since then. It, it, it got weird because there, there were other, there, there's a, you, it's the government. So there's this slow process of how are we going to implement that. And so different agencies like the DOD, um, they chose to implement the CMO order by putting out policies that said we will have a an office of a deputy chief management officer. So basically the DEPSEC DEF, that's too high ranking to actually do stuff. He's the figurehead. But we have the deputy chief management officer's office um, who is responsible for actually doing it. And so the ODCMO reports to the CMO who reports to the, a yeah, anyway, so you have to have alphabet soup because in this example it's the Department of Defense. <laughs> um, but, but true story, the, the OSD what they called the CPI slash LSS office, the Continuous Process Improvement slash Lean Six Sigma office. Mm -hmm. They did that on purpose because they didn't know if Lean Six Sigma was gonna stick around, but they knew Continuous Process Improvement was. 
So they stood up the CPI LSS office. I know this because I was one of the first master black belts that they hired in to support that office. And one of the four first projects that we had was, what does this even mean? So we need to define the standards. What, what is Lean Six Sigma? What, are, what, is, what is the body of knowledge that constitutes Lean Six Sigma? What are the taxonomy levels for these, for these things that our people need to know? If you're going to be a green belt, what does that mean? A black belt, a master black belt? We've got how many millions of people work for the federal government? I mean, we've got, <laughs> we've got a lot of folks just wearing uniforms. We've got a lot of folks, you know, hundreds of thousands in different agencies. Just the VA alone has a few hundred thousand. Um, just Missile Defense Agency alone has. Anyway, so this is a huge organization. And so I was, I was the lucky stucky who got to create this, this Lean Six Sigma certification standards and bodies of knowledge, which we published in, uh, in March of, of 2009. Um, and it was signed off by the, um, by the ODCMO at, at that point, Beth McGrath. Um, she was the first um, deputy chief management officer for, for the DOD. So I, I, I said that to say, if you backdate that, I, I think the executive order came out 2007, 2006, I don't remember, but, uh, but yeah. So, uh, but that's, that's still out there. I mean, that, those, those standards are still out there. <laughs> On that note, here, as we, as we wrap this up, I wanna thank you for taking the time to watch this module, this, this introduction. I know it's a little bit longer version of the history. I mean, you can go on YouTube and find five minute clips, but it doesn't do justice to what lean Six Sigma theory constraints, again, human centered design, all these pieces, how they tie in. So we wanted to take time to do something that's just not out there, which is to give you a nice, robust view about where this came from, why it's not going anywhere, because how I want to end is this. I challenge you to find me an organization that's not using lean concepts and principles, using Six Sigma in some way. They might call it a different name. We've worked with clients that are like, oh, don't call it Lean Six Sigma. Don't use that belt system. We go, yeah, okay, whatever. And all we're gonna be doing is the same body of knowledge, the same material, just calling it a different name because you feel better about it, which is fine. We see that all the time. But I will challenge you to find me an organization that doesn't. Apple, Google, Tesla, all of them. Listen to him talking. Interviews with Elon Musk, for instance. Watch him on YouTube. What, you're gonna hear him referencing Lean Concepts all the time. They all are, Walmart, and the list goes on and on and on. This isn't going anywhere. So I just want to encourage you as you're beginning, so you're, you're beginning your walk and your journey in this Lean and Six Sigma world. It's a long journey, but it's a fun journey filled with a lot of good knowledge, information, tools, frameworks, methodologies. There's so much to learn, but don't be overwhelmed. It's okay, you can start tomorrow. But I encourage you as you as you embark on this journey, get yourself a good mentor and get going with it tomorrow. This, this Lean and Six Sigma are actually a lot of fun. I like to tell people, and this is the truth, I don't work. I don't work for a living. I love what I do. It's a playground for me, fixing problems, solving problems, you know, finding opportunities, making companies better, making people's lives better. That's what it's all about. Lean and Six Sigma are how do we make people's lives better? customers, employees, business owners, you name it. We're here to make the world a better place, honestly. So thank you for spending some time with us. Dr. B, I'd like to say thank you for taking the time to, to come out here today and, and join me on this uh, endeavor. So I appreciate all the knowledge and the wisdom that he's poured into us today. But uh, on that note, we'll catch you in the next module.